Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luann Nigara. Luann has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Before I start the show, I want to give a big shout out to LaFroy Brooks. They are hosting our upcoming podcast two-year birthday party at their New York City showroom this February 21st, 2018. We have an RSVP set up at luannnigara.com slash party. That's L-U-A-N-N-N-I-G-A-R-A dot com slash party party. Okay. All the details are there. Now I don't want to put a damper on things, but the space is limited. So tell all the designer besties you want, but make sure that they and you are SVP. The event is free. Thank you to the generosity of LaFroy Brooks, but you have to be all legit with an actual RSVP for the event. Okay. Now, if you're familiar with high-end plumbing and bathroom fixtures, then I probably don't need to tell you who LaFroy Brooks is. However, as familiar familiar as you may be with their products, you might not know their story. And luckily, we are going to have the president, Warren Pearl, with me on the show next week, telling us all about the LaFroy Brooks story and about the products for you to source for your interior design projects. Now, on to today's show. I have one half of the dynamic duo of Madcap Cottage with me today. John Lucky and Jason Oliver Nixon are the men of the North Carolina and New York-based interior design firm, Madcap Cottage. Today, Jason Oliver Nixon joins me, and we talk about how they have cultivated a brand and a niche by following their passion and by being true to themselves. They are known for their whimsical use of color and pattern, and together the Madcap Gents, along with their pound rescue posse, Jasper, Weenie, and Amy Petunia scour the world for eclectic finds that capture their eye. The Madcap Cottage gents run their firm, an ever-changing design laboratory from a former pharmacy in the, high, in the heart of High Point, North Carolina. You can find the Madcap Cottage curated selection of vintage and antique finds on One Kings Lane and First Dib. And you can shop the Madcap Cottage line of bedding, window treatments, and pillows exclusively on HSN at hsn.com. The Madcaps also launched their debut fabric collection for Robert Allen at Home, which is a grouping full of whimsy, fun, and travel-inspired motifs. During the conversation, Jason Oliver explains how intense their schedule can be with travel for clients, their book tour, and speaking appearances. And he mentions how important it is for them that when they are working, that they are focused and efficient when they are on the in their studio in North Carolina. This is the backbone of every successful business, efficiency in your processes. If you need some help in this area, reach out to our show sponsor, My Doma Studio. My Doma Studio helps you organize your projects, your client communications, and your vendor communications all in one convenient place. You can even customize the appearance to your brand so you're not only efficient, but you present professionally as well as organized. Go to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business and you can see how they can help you be more profitable that's m-y-d-o-m-a studio.com slash a well-designed business all righty are you ready to meet jason oliver nixon hi jason oliver thank you so much for joining me on a well-designed business today Luann, it's great to be with you today. I know. I've been looking forward to our interview um, because we're going to be, you know, buddies down there at the IWCE conference in Tampa, the International Window Coverings Expo Conference. And I keynoted last year, and you and John Locke are keynoting this year. So I'm really looking forward to meeting you in person in addition to this conversation here. 
and likewise, what 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 good footsteps to follow? Ah. And, I'm, and I'm and I'm and I'm from Tampa, so I'm actually a native down there. So oh. I not only do I get to talk to great audiences and talk about our passion for window treatments, but I get a tick off seeing my parents. Oh well, that is there, a yeah. double win, right? <laughs> I love any time I have events that bring me to places where my people are. <laughs> I was very lucky last year. I had two different events, both in Southern California, and my dad and my brother um, lived right there. My dad, and, and really, I'm so lucky. My I had the last event was in Anaheim, literally 10 minutes from my dad, and my dad just passed away a couple of weeks ago, so I got to spend the whole week with him. It was great. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So, so you'll get to see your parents. That's awesome. Now, um, we're going to talk about the IDWCE a little bit later in the show, um, but just everybody know that it is the Inter- International Window Coverings Expo, and Jason Oliver and John will be there from Madcap College Cottage giving you the, your keynote address, and I, I know that's going to be so much fun. So, But today we're going to talk a little bit about your business, Madcap Cottage, and there's, a, there's so many parts about your business, Jason Oliver, that have um, intrigued me because what, what the number one thing that I would love to point out is that, first of all, if anybody is unfamiliar with Madcap Cottage, you need to take a look at the website, and it's going to be um, m- most of this conversation will make a lot more sense and, and really drive the impact home of what I'm about to say to you once you really see their website and the aesthetic. But the thing is that you stand so firmly in your space of your design aesthetic. And I'm just going to read to everybody in case this is um, new for them and they're not familiar. And, you know, Jason Oliver, a lot of people are driving and they can't look at the website now. But there is a line on your website that describes the design that you and John do. And it says, British country house mixed with granny antiques, mixed with chinoiserie chic, mixed with Moroccan meets India. (laughs) (laughs) You want to talk about standing in your space. And and you even go so far many, many times throughout the website to say, if you're interested in base, just keep moving on. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, Dorothy Draper once said, banish the beige. And I think that we really followed that uh, to the T uh, for sure. Yeah. So, and do you know, I think why I'm making such a big deal about it right off the bat from the beginning of the conversation is because... I think it's very, you know what it is? This is what I want to tell you that I think is rare about it. It's not so rare for a designer to stand in their space and say, I'm a modern interior designer or I'm a traditional. But even the word modern or traditional encompasses so many different looks. But you guys stand in your space and you're like, this is how we do things here. (laughs) And if you don't like it, move on down the lane. So talk to me a little bit, explain to our colleagues, Jason Oliver, a little bit about how is is just the most fortunate thing on the planet that the two of you share this love? How did you come to it? Did you ever struggle with just saying, no, this is how we're going to do it? Or did it evolve as the two of you grew in your confidence and as interior designers? Yeah, I mean, Luann, I think that what you'll find with us is we bring our clients' storylines to life. And so not everything that we do is India meets Morocco mm-hmm. meets British Country House. I mean, that's kind of our overarching theme. But we've done neutral homes, but everything has a vein. Everything has a certain color component. Everything has a prints and pattern that we've really elevated our clients' stories and challenged them and brought out attributes that they perhaps didn't know. They're obviously coming to us for for a reason, Mm. um, but also that idea that I think that they know that we can really get inside their personal brand, i.e. their interiors, and tap something that maybe they're not capable of doing. So for us, it's it's really not our way or the highway, but none of our projects look alike. Mm. Whether we're doing doing a big, big house outside of Washington, D.C., we're doing another home in Connecticut, we're doing an apartment for the president of a major jewelry comp- company in New York. We're doing a small home in, in Sarasota, and none of them look alike, but they all have a definite uh, pattern and color sensibility. And I think that some of our clients start off saying, I want this. And as we drill down 
And as former magazine editors, really kind of getting inside their heads and getting them to tell their story, we deep dive and we go from maybe somebody wanting the Raleigh Hotel in Miami to all of a sudden it becomes a taste of the Raleigh, but it's really more Shanghai 1930. Mm. So I think that, you know, for us, John and I are lucky enough, we've, you know, we've worked together for about 12 years, but we're both former magazine editors and television producers and mm. we both come to the table and said how can we get people to tell their stories and i think that there are interior designers out there who are quite well known and and are very talented but their projects look quite similar that mm. you know that this designer did this apartment in new york and you can probably see very similar similar much similarities between a project they did in palm springs or la with us that's not necessarily the case because we don't want it to look like us we're, we're we, if you want to if you want to logoed handbag we're not your people right. you know if you want luann living in new jersey you and your husband like x y and z and you want the following we will bring that story to life so really for us the challenge is you know we we know designers that show the same fabrics to every client you know they right. kind of have 20 go-to fabrics we very rarely show the same fabrics to two different clients so that maybe it's more work for us but it really brings the client's personality and uh, and bespoke and unique, uh, and everything is, is, is it really is very much a unique storyline. Well, there's a lot in there that my brain is reeling because there's a couple. Did I of, answer the question? You did, you did, <laughs> but of course it's brought up like about five other questions, and I'm thinking, which one do I go with first? <laughs> so one of the first things that occurs to me is that. I hear what you're saying that clearly each home you are your main goal is to bring out it sounds like almost the not the hidden desire but a, maybe an unwakened desire that the client might have previously not realized was there like a, you know whatever that is okay but I think what you're saying is even though you are completely capable and have produced rooms, environments that have more or less a neutral palette, am I right to assume that that some part of that room is going to have that signature punch of some pattern or color? It's not going to be just all tonally beige, white, and ivory. You're going to then... What's what honors your client, yes, but absolutely. it's gonna right, absolutely. okay, right. We will challenge them and push them, and I think that's why we wrote our book, our new book from Abrams, you know, Prince Charming, create absolutely beautiful interiors with prints and patterns because all of our clients want permission to bring prints and pattern into their life. They're looking for someone to say, it's okay, we will show you how to do it. And so, for the consumer out there who doesn't have access to us. Um, you know, and I certainly hope everyone's following us on Instagram and that journey. But if you don't have direct access to us, the book was that primer of you can do it yourself from mm -hmm. baby steps all the way up to more advanced steps up that food chain and really giving the client permission. No, we're not going to create the lobby of the Four Seasons Hotel in New York where it is beige, 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 and beige. We are going to bring that, we are going to bring patterns in. And even if they are you know, more neutral tone patterns, there are going to be a lot of patterns in that room. But I think to your point, that's why people come to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and if they want something that looks just like a certain hotel that is beige or something like that, I, we would say, you know what, maybe that's not the right fit. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll send you along to somebody else who's really good in that space. Right, right, right. So it sounds... you know, I haven't done, I've certainly done, we've, John and I have certainly done very modern homes, mm -hmm. very traditional homes. We've done eclectic and we've done bohemian. Um, and I, you know, I love mid-century, but I don't want to do a room that's all mid-century. I want to have a piece of mid-century next to a Louis the Fourteenth chair, next to a Jean-Michel Franck styled something uh, with with vintage prints on the wall. So for us, it's very much about it's not a head-to-toe look ever. Right, 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 right. And so, and and I did see on the website you have one room that I would say is l more leaning towards the modern. It's the room with the red sofa and then the yellow sofa and the red draperies and and. It was, and it was, but it still has that, that pop of color. It has that whimsy to it that has that personality coming through, even though it was a more sleek, modern line on the furniture. Right. Right. So there, the, the prints and pattern story is color blocking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of prints in that space, but prints don't have to be florals and stripes. It right. can be a red next to a yellow next to a pink, and all of a sudden it's a very modern story, but there's still a lot of color and pattern going on. And if you look at the walls in that room, they're actually striped. 
between uh, eggshell and, and a high gloss. And so mm. you get this white stripe around the room. So while they are white walls, they're really not. Right, right, right. They've got your, your print going mm-hmm. on. Yep. Now, there's a couple of things in there, though, that I just want to uh, say and really kind of sort of clarify, because you've said a couple of times that you challenge and push a client to go further and deeper to what they truly you know, you you ultimately feel that they want and that you're successful in that, you know, yes, you don't have to be afraid of print and maybe you've been afraid and, and now you've challenged and pushed them to discover that and to go down that road with you. But I have to say, in less capable hands, less experienced hands, you could, if you're, in other words, you could be a tremendous persuader and not be an astute listener. And if you are only a tremendous persuader and not an astute listener or astute judge, then you could, a lesser experienced designer, could find themselves, like you said, challenging a client to go down a road. And then when they all get there, the client go, oh my goodness, why did I do this? And why did you let me do this? So it's not, do you agree though, Jason Oliver, that there is, you know, I can hear that you're extremely experienced and that you have a vision and that people, I think one of the fail safes is that somebody sort of knows what they're, even if they come to you and say, I kind of want neutral, they, they, like you said, they're not coming to you if they're, they really don't want any color. But do you see what I'm saying? A lesser experienced designer has to be careful of pretending to themselves that all they've done is challenged a client to really discover what they really want as opposed to put upon them a design or a plan that is really not their comfort zone. Yeah, and I think, Luann, we're definitely intuitive and thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And during the process, we are giving them John's beautiful watercolors, not only CAD renderings that show kind of placement of things, but also watercolors that Mm -hmm. give that hand touch quality so that the client can really see uh, what that space is going to look like. But I mean, it, you know, we have, you know, not every client loves everything we do. And, you know, through that process, that's why we have several meetings and that design process, because it's really an editing process. Mm-hmm. And that's what we see ourselves as, is coming from, you know, from, from books and magazines, we see ourselves as editors and we are editing down on their likes and dislikes. And we might start with 60 fabrics and get down to 30 and then get down to 10. And then we talk about budget and how does that fit in and all those kind of things. But yeah, I mean, I think that we're giving them really good visual cues. We're looking at tear sheets. We're looking at books. We're looking at movies that they like. And what was it about Auntie Mame's living room in her first incarnation that they loved? <laughs> and how do you connect the dot between a hotel that they traveled to? And I think that, you know, for us, we are our students and we're constantly learning and we're constantly traveling and traveling can be high end to India or it could be going to Cracker Barrel or in <laughs> Iowa and we don't negate we don't negate any of those experiences. Right. We take lots of road trips and it keeps our eye tuned and our our clients often uh, educate us about things that they're that they've experienced. But I think that um, we're able to deliver because to your point we very much do listen mm-hmm. and we very much uh, you know, we're not, we're not saying it's our way or the highway. Right, right, right. Uh, we are saying it's, it's, we want to create something that you can, not only is it beautiful, but when you walk in, you want to put your feet, feet up mm. and you have dogs and you have kids and you have nieces and nephews <laughs> and you drink red wine. And I still want it to look great. I don't want to walk into a room in the Hamptons that's all white and you're not allowed to go in there. Uh, because, you know, I had Italian grandparents who had rooms with, that were slip covered in plastic <laughs> furniture. And it's the same. It's not more high end. I mean, this is, you know, in Sarasota, Florida in the 70s. But this, it's the same thing. And who wants I mean, that's not how we live today. We right. want rooms that are functioning and 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 work, but also look good. Right. But don't have to. You don't fluff the pillows every six seconds. They still have to look great. And that that's how we live. Right. Right. I you love know, it. Not, I love it. I just think that. Um, I just went and make the caution that you, when somebody, a team as experienced as the two of you are, especially because like you said, it's not just your design experience together these last, you know, a decade or so. It's, it's also what you know, your previous career is informing both of you. And that is a whole skill set from being, um, magazine editors and television producers that really does also inform that talent and ability to drill down and really get 
finite on what you know somebody wants and that you are clear on it. So, well, um, and I think that our clients are also looking to us kind of as lifestyle. Mm-hmm. They are they are asking us about where we're traveling. They're asking us about restaurants. They ask us about fashion. Mm-hmm. And it's not that we're the most stylish people, but I think that we have a good worldview and we're always searching out the latest and greatest and taking that taking turning down that alley and finding that great little restaurant that's been around forever that you know, maybe you haven't heard of. And so we love that we're helping our clients not only to bring their brand to life through their interiors, but gee, maybe they're going to Portugal now because they we talked about a trip we did to Sintra last year, mm-hmm. or that they're trying something new, or they found a, an ex- fashion accessories company that we stumbled on. So for us, we it very much ties into that idea of Madcap Cottage, and I say that humble pie, but the idea of Madcap Cottage becoming a, a br- is a brand, it's not us. And it's, you know, we, we did not name the firm Jason Oliver Nixon or John Lucky, not only because uh, that just wasn't our thing and you couldn't spell Lucky, but we wanted people to be part of <laughs> Mad Cat Cottage uh, and to be part of a sticky brand that you could transcend from, from interior design to product to any category that they say they want to be, there, there's a fun, there's a spirit, there's an energy to it and they want to be part of it. Okay. Well, I have to say, um, it's it's very it's a very interesting way of looking at everything and it's it's so energizing hearing you describe it the passion that you have for it comes through so clearly and i would love to ask you a little bit about the germination of it the beginning of it so tell me do you the two of you john start out as interior designers and you think hey this is a really cool thing we're doing together and hey look what it's growing into or is it something that the two of you from the beginning, you know, had a roadmap, had a plan and had a vision of this, like you said, this brand, this madcap cottage that encompasses all parts of your client's lifestyle. I would say, Luann, there's a mix of, I think that there was definitely purpose to our plan, but some things were more jerry-rigged than other. Nothing is A to B to C to D. And I think that, you know, for us coming out of magazines, we were very much students of the Martha Stewart School, where when she created the Omni Media concept, you know, 30 years ago or whenever it was, she was so far ahead of her time. And that idea that magazines could lead to merchandising, merchandising could lead to magazines, magazines, et cetera, et cetera, that we had a, had a big moment of we, we liked what she was doing and that she could carry that story across different lines and different products and different categories. And we very much were conscious of, of, of her rethinking that model. And we wanted to do something similar. And I think that when John and I both graduated from college and went into magazines, we again thought of ourselves as storytellers and we mm-hmm. hopped between different media. John you know, went to what is a house beautiful and parents and American home style and ladies home journal. And I was at Condé Nast traveler. And then I was a senior editor at random house and, I started Niche Media, got with Jason Bin, Gotham and Hamptons and Los Angeles Confidential as the editor-in-chief, and then I was a producer at the Food Network, and I think that it was an idea that at a certain point, we were always passionate about interiors, and we didn't go to interior design school. John went to graphic design and journalism, and I went to Colby and studied Spanish literature and art. And my dad called me and said, how much money do we spend on that? And, you know, but, you know, we talk about liberal arts, but I think that we reached a point where John was styling stories. I was writing stories. I was producing stories. John was producing stories and we were creating engaging content. Mm. And a lot of it was in the home and shelter space. And at a certain point we said, why are we writing about everyone else's stuff? We know how to do this ourselves mm. because we had trained ourselves in the magazine sphere and we tackled a project out in the Hamptons, and it ended up running an Oprah Elwood Home, the Oprah magazine at the Jeez. time. And and it was kind of that eureka moment of the shingle went up, and the plan was born. And some of it, some of it was uh, planned. A lot of it was organic. Uh, but I think that that we are constantly rethinking. You know, fast forward to today, we are constantly rethinking the model and even saying, you know, gee, does this relationship work? Does it not work? Or what new categories do we want to go into? You know, we don't have a licensing person. We don't have a PR person. We have a great small team here in High Point where we're based after all those years in New York. But there's there's definitely, you know, we definitely have, have walls here of 
of I'm a bill on Capitol Hill and how do I get from A to B to C to D to E, but that's okay if we're going to Q to R to X Mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, But but being very thoughtful and intuitive in those decisions and not slapping names on anything and saying why, there there has to be a why attached Mm. to everything. And if it's not a moneymaker, it has to be, it has to be a driver to other components of our business um, but, uh, but it's, it's a fun journey. And I think that, you know, when you fall on your face, that's when you learn and we don't necessarily fall on our face, but you, we ha- you have missteps or, or adventures that maybe go a little awry sometimes, but that's where you learn and that's where you rejigger. And that's where you say, maybe I want to play in a different sandbox next time. Right. I love it. The thing is, I, there's a couple things in there. I love the there has to be a why. I, I, I say that all the time on the show. What is your why? I say it all the time in the one on one coaching. And if it's not making you money, tell me what it's doing for you. Because if it's not if you can't enunciate what it's doing for you, why are we wasting our time on it? Right. Number one. And then the other thing is that um, I just love to ask you, I think it's so interesting how in the course of two years on the podcast, I have had the opportunity to meet interior designers that achieve at the level that you guys do. We're talking, you know, top, top in the country and have not attended interior design school. And it's what I, two things about it. I recently had uh, a young designer say to me, if I haven't been to interior design school, can I call myself an interior designer? Do I have to call myself a decorator? And it was this whole discussion. And finally, the upshot, most of it was, it's really in your head. The rest of the world is not thinking about it, but whatever. And and so that's a whole thing. But I have two questions for you on it. Is that, is number one, what's your feeling on that? And number two, it's, look, there's nobody's looking at your portfolio and doesn't think that you don't know what you're doing. My question is, your innate taste, both of you, you obviously have innate taste and style. And of course, everything, like you said, that you learned and taught yourself through all the years of, at the magazines. But what happened in the beginning when it was time to do a floor plan? Did you just simply hire a CAD person and say, this is all the sofas and the things I want just put it on a plan and make sure it fits or did you teach yourselves that as well well I think when we started out I don't even know if we had CAD 12 15 <laughs> years ago so it was you know when I started at magazines graph paper we still and, had a, typewriters. and a I mean, it, was, it, was, it was so old school um, no I think that I think that we really trained ourselves to, to understanding scale mm-hmm. and because John is a painter and and is really good at sketching and using watercolors that was always you know, you know, from, from, the, you know, John, and I've been together personally for, for 20 years now. Mm. And he always has always carried, you know, watercolors with him when we travel and diaries and sketches and paints and all those kind of things. So I think he's always had that great visual eye. I'm much more about, I can tell you if I like something, I, I find things, you know, we can go off into a department store for two hours and we come back to, to come back together and we've picked out the same five things. <laughs> so it's, you know, I think that we're obviously very attuned but I think it was just training ourselves. Where, you know, I didn't go to journalism school, but I really taught myself um, through creative writing classes and, and good mentors when I started in, in magazines at Condé Nast who took me under wing and helped me. And obviously, John has a degree in, in graphic design, but that was graphic design from 25 years ago. Right. So that – Different know, story. Yeah, they barely had computers then. Mm-hmm. So, you know, or they had, you know, strange discs that you had to carry in little boxes. <laughs> your lap. So, no, I think it was it was training ourselves. And I think that, you know, there are obviously organizations out there that are making it difficult for interior designers to be called interior designers. And in Florida, I think you have to be, if you're published, you have to be a decorator. And that's, I think that's silliness. Um, but I think that, you know, we, we trained ourselves and now obviously we have a, we have a CAD person who's great and mm-hmm. part, who works with us and helps round out the story. But even if we didn't have, uh, the, you know, the CAD, you would still get these great hand drawn visuals that would still tell the story. It's just one more tool. We're very much believers in technology where technology makes sense. I, I, I hate nothing more than walking into a a hotel room where you're you think you're turning the blinds you know you're turning the lights on and the blinds go down right 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 and and that idea that you know for me luxury in a hotel is if i can't find an outlet next to my bedside uh, table i know with the first 30 seconds I to know. Plug the phone, 
I don't care if you're Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton <laughs> or Peninsula. You're you're all of a sudden you're a Red Roof Inn. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I think Red Roof Inns are probably okay. But um, <laughs> so I I, I, my, I I'm going in a circle as you said, Luann. But I think that idea of <laughs> we we trained ourselves, and I think mm. that I don't you know if I'm doing um, a project that requires an architect, I hire an architect. Mm-hmm. If I'm doing a small hotel that has codes related to it. I hire somebody who understands the codes associated with the hospitality industry. I do not need to go get CEUs and um, do things that, that, you know, I need to train my eye and I mm-hmm. need to know about more fabrics and I need mm-hmm. to know about the scale and I need to look at trends that are happening or, or new places that I think are going to be, you know, what is it about Portugal now that we're all kind of lapping up? Right. And so for me, it's, it's hiring talented people around me who will round out the experience or round out the things that I don't, that John and I don't know. And that's not negating anything. Right. That's just saying it's, it's, I don't, I, I have a brain trust of people that I can tap and if I need them, I need them. And I'm obviously not going to go do engineering work because I'm not an engineer. <laughs> exactly. And if, it needs to be, if it needs to be fire treated, it needs to be fire treated and someone will tell me how to do that right no I I think it's terrific because what I'm hearing is is that it starts with an inner confidence and and this was sort of the way the discussion went with the designer I was talking about I said don't think about labeling what you aren't you know if you're not a degreed interior designer don't worry about labeling that and having a conversation with every client that says you know I'm not a degreed interior designer label the things that you are you know what I mean? Own the skills and the talents that you have. Sure. And that's exactly what you just said. You have your own confidence. You have your own vision. The two of you have a purpose. You have a plan. And you have a get it done attitude. It's like, if I know how to do it, I'll get it done. If I need somebody else to do it because it's not my skill set, I'll hire that person to do it. And so I think that is, you know, the only c- critical thing is to never pretend to do something that you don't know how to do. <laughs> that's the only thing. Um, right. And, right. And get right, right, yourself right. into that's trouble. Right. You got to, you got to, you got to make you got to fake it till you make it some in some situations yes, right but, but not, not like but with not, codes and things like that <laughs> exactly no i think it's awesome i think it's really terrific so so talk to me about building this brand out you mentioned the model of Ma- of martha stewart how the two of you took a look at this and saw how she went from magazine to you know sheets and macy's to a line in target and everything else and you guys are are doing a lot the same thing i noticed that you have um a line of Roman shades and balances with Smith and Noble. You have a fabric line with Robert Allen. Um, you have quite a few things going on. And of course, in addition to the book. So tell us a little bit about when and how you, the two of you, like what, what, what's the moment? The moment is from the beginning. This is the platform. We want to be everywhere. Or one of you has a stroke of insight. And, and how does the action go? How does the thing go from an, an idea to an action? Well, we want to create we want to create interiors and products that are special. We create spaces for our clients that perfectly suit them. When we create product, we create product that we don't think has been put in the marketplace before. So, you know, for us when we create fabrics, we're creating fabrics that we want to use. We're creating lighting that we want to use. We're creating window treatments that we want to use that our clients will want to use. So if you went into our house here in High Point, every fabric in our home is either vintage, and it's not saying that there aren't great, 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 obviously other fabrics out there, but we're creating the fabrics that we want to use and that we think that every, that other people will want to use. And our, all the new fabrics in our home are our Madcap Cottage for Robert Allen at Home fabrics. So for us, I think it was we're always looking for opportunity, but I think it's that idea of having that road. We always have a road map of here's where we are, here's where we want to be, here's the three-month plan, the six-month plan, and the three-year plan of where are we with clients, where are we with product, where are we with the marketing story, where are we with social, where are we with telling and engaging new audiences, are, where are we with the public speaking, how are we bringing that message out there through different channels, both locally, nationally, and globally. The, there's a real push for us that we want to have a certain brand presence in Japan in the next couple of years because we think that Asia, we're lucky enough to get 
some nice press in Asia, but they that that market definitely resp- responds to prints and pattern. And looking at people like Kath Kidston or Paul Smith, who've been able to bring a sense of whimsy and fun, and with Kath Kidston perhaps a sense of nostalgia from the British marketplace into an Asian space, what have they done? What can we learn from them? How can we slice and dice? the American pie in a way to say, huh, we, we're, we're tapping this huge market in a certain way, but how can we speak to other audiences, perhaps England, and doing a pop-up shop with Liberty of London? How can we look at Tokyo? How can we look at the bricks? How can we look at other marketplaces and engage new audiences? So th- I think for us, we're always thinking, Make sure you that we're writing handwritten thank you notes on a, ma- on a on a micro level, but on a macro level, making sure that we're looking at that that much larger landscape out there, and saying, uh, how can we speak to that audience? But gee, maybe we should be doing rugs because we think that there's a point of view, and I think that everything that we do, Luann, is about a point of view, mm. and having a strong point of view that we can translate to many different price points and many different audiences, and show people how to use. You know, for us, it's really showing people that saying, "Hey, we've got a, you know, this is a this is kind of a, a, a wonderful floral, but we'll show you how you can use a floral in a space that that will perfectly mirror your sensibility and won't make you feel granny and won't make you feel that it's your husband won't like it or your wife won't like it or whatever it is." Um, and it's how do you engage new audiences and and bring them along on that ride. <laughs> I, I, my brain is again all over the place based on the things that you're saying. I'm first of all, I, I want to drive home the point that you said in there that everything supports your point of view and it's a strong point of view. This is this is the secret sauce in almost every business is to have a strong point of view and to know what it is. I always say it's to have to know what your company mission is, right? To know yourself mm-hmm. and to know mm-hmm. your company so well that you know everything that you do supports it. And you're not afraid to put a stake in a certain area because you have the confidence where you say, like we said a few minutes ago, go is what is your why? Okay, let me go out and and do this. So you see trends happening in Japan, and that's so interesting and so forward-thinking. And so the two of you have a conversation, and you say, maybe we should try and get into the Japanese market. And then it's like, even if one of you has a moment of, I don't know, should we? The first question is, well, does it support our point of view? Does it support our company mission? Yes, the answer comes back. Well, there's a whole lot of things happening with print there, and this one and that one is exposing it, and there's an opportunity there. So the answer is a resounding yes, let's go for it. Right. As opposed to let's let's put our stake in Russia. Well, why? Well, why not? Russia looks good. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're right. 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 You I, think, I think we 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 spend a lot of time educating ourselves. Yeah, I can hear it. it educated decisions and they're not always the right decisions. Right. But if we, we don't go into any situation blind. Willy nilly. And, no, there's never any willy nilly, no, and I hear it. it doesn't mean you're going to be a resounding success. Right. You know, there's certainly things that we try to. It's say, business. You know it's that never was, always going to be unfair. perfect. <laughs> right, and I think, but I think that if you're looking at the landscape too, and 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 flexible, mm-hmm. that something might be right for right now, and three years down the road, it's not the same. Right, right, and to be able to be nimble and to be able to pivot on on things and say gee this was great now but maybe not not uh, or no, it was this was great then but maybe not now that if you can if you can grow and scale but remain nimble mm-hmm. still have the why and the why has maybe changed differently but that's okay and 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 to say it was great and 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 move on Exactly. I mean, look, no one says that every decision you make on Monday in 2018 in January is going to be a good decision or work out January 2019. The point is you can only make decisions based on the information you have, but you have to make them based on the information. You can't just say, well, why not? (laughs) You know, and that's what I'm hearing with the two of you, that you are very intentional and very purposeful in what you do and how you do it. What I'm curious is, is 
how do you find the time? You mentioned multiple initiatives that you have your client initiatives, you have your product initiatives, you have your marketing initiatives, you have your story brand storyline initiatives, you have your social media initiatives, you have your public speaking initiatives, and then you have these initiatives for all of these on a local, national, and international level. That's, I'm exhausted saying it, let alone <laughs> thinking about it. And so my question to you is, how... I love that because now I need, this is what I need. As soon as you did it, I wrote it all down. I thought I need all of those titles uh, uh, written in my office and I need to intentionally make sure I'm touching each of these and working towards them. I love it. Like I'm totally like, whoa, mind blown. Okay. But in practice, is it, what is your work week like your, you, your three month, your six month, your one year, your three year goals? Do you and John have, um, you know, do you have m weekly meetings that are deal with, you know, low level, not low level because clients are high level priorities, but I mean, task level stuff. Do you have, do you, like I met somebody that said that they every quarter go away with their partner who is their business partner for a weekend and literally just do the big picture dreaming where do you two find time to organize your thoughts and your research to come up with your next initiatives and your plans and to figure out which of the ones that you've already set in motion need pivots I think we have we're not big meeting people but I think we probably have one overarching meeting every week mm -hmm. but because we're, we spend all of our time together mm -hmm. literally all of our time together <laughs> we're constantly talking and throwing ideas and we're big believers in index <laughs> cards and writing things down there and I don't want to sound too hippy dippy but we're big believers and you put it out there and you reel it in yes and and uh, I don't mean you get woo-woo there but it's an idea that go with we, go woo-woo I'm all about okay, woo-woo <laughs> Put it on an index card and we get it. I love it. I love it. Doesn't, it. That doesn't mean it's going to be the best fit, but maybe we'll get it and we explore it and we try it and see where it goes. I love so it. So I think that, you know, for us, we take a lot of road trips. So we're constantly talking and we keep notebooks and it's lists of, of great things. And, and we, like you and probably most people you speak with, love what we do. And so there really is no differentiation. You know, for me, going to the beach is boring i might want to sit on the beach for about an hour <laughs> you, or a hour. half hour <laughs> okay i you know i had my margarita ticked red <laughs> trashy part of trashy novel tick and now i want to do something else so i think that for us you know i think that the, one of the big challenges for us in the last two years because we have been launching and book tour and all this kind of other stuff is the travel and 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 we're on the road you know, we're leaving this afternoon for Washington, D.C., where we're speaking at an event, and then we're flying to New York, and then we're flying to Los Angeles, and then we're flying back to New York where we're speaking at three events, and then we're flying back. And that's two weeks, and so that's wow. two weeks out of the office. And while we're so fortunate and lucky, and they're great things, they are revenue drivers, and they are – you know, occasions that are going to move the needle forward for mm -hmm. us, it's not having office time right. is, is getting tricky. And so I think that that's where our balance is getting a little askew. And we're trying to move into 2018, probably next month with, with, uh, because the schedule is slowing down a little bit. That's where it gets tricky because we try and fit in six days worth of work into three days. And mm -hmm. we're very good at that because I think we've always discovered and, and saying, again, saying this humble pie that we work, we're very, efficient and I think that our we we don't do anything you know kind of half ass and um so but I think that that's where it gets tricky for us is being on the road so much I don't want to be lugging you know client LL Bean tote bags around the country because I have to address uh, you know a situation I'm in, in, and having binders and you know those kind of things so I think that we work you know Denise McGahey who's a good friend called us the hardest working couple in the design business the other day which I thought was really nice, but I don't necessarily know, want to be known for that. I want to be known for thoughtful and, and, and great design and fun design. Um, but I think as I get older, you know, I want to, you know, we do pretty much work through, you know, every, you know, Maggie Smith said in Downton Abbey, what's a weekend. Right. And I think that, you know, running a small business comes with those challenges. Uh, but we haven't burned out and I don't mm -hmm. see ourselves burning out. And I have, 
uh, keep a very small staff and I don't have high overheads and I don't have, so we're pretty lucky. I, you know, pay cash for my house. I don't have debt and I can kind of, I can kind of scale it any way I want to, but we, it's prime time, baby. So we're not slowing down anytime <laughs> soon. That's I, awesome. feel, yeah, I mean, like you, the way I wake up, we, John, and I wake up every day and we feel so fortunate and we're building our team and we have some really good people aboard and we just feel so lucky and, and humble and, and, thankful and if we can make someone's life better and they reflect that on Instagram or you don't ever hear it but you feel like you're doing so you're putting something out there then it's all worthwhile yeah it's awesome it's awesome so that is really I'm so happy for you that um you know it's funny I I I feel the same way what's a weekend and and when you're passionate and you're involved in what you're doing it's almost like you know it's it's such a cliche but work hard play hard right it's like I'm gonna work 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 and then when I'm gonna play I'm gonna play 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 and maybe they're not balanced but you know what I'm I have a great life <laughs> so right it's, exactly. It's, exactly it's it's an internal yeah. balance right it's it's the, the balance isn't some external hey 40 hours of work and 40 hours of play it's like whatever it is what makes you happy but it has to be productive and I hear that that you are efficient when you're there if you're, you have like you said you have three days to work on client work because you have a 10-week road trip then you know I don't imagine that you're putzing around in the office those three days you're in there and you're getting it done right yeah, and I mean, you know, I, I think even even silliness, like we had a little country house up in the Catskills when we lived in New York, and we found we would go up there, and we were, were passionate gardeners, but we created all these projects where we created gardens, and, and I swore I would never be that kid who would go down with my parents to our beach house and spend the entire we- weekend weeding, <laughs> and sure enough, we bought this little teeny house in the Catskills, and I spent my entire weekend weeding. You know, I, you know, I had people who helped me and mowed the lawn, but we got rid of that house this year, and I miss it sort of, but not really, because I think that, you know, for 2018, it's about being effective, effective efficient and streamlined. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to just layer on more projects. I want, I want, if I want downtime, I want to have downtime. I'd rather go stay in a hotel and, Mm -hmm. and, or get a VRBO where I I turn the key and I'm in the the refrigerator leaks. It's not my problem. So I think for us moving forward, we're trying to work even more efficiently than we do and to be more streamlined and to have those right people in place that will take off some of the to, the to do's that we didn't delegate before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and the truth is, it's it is a personal decision. Like for you now, it's nice when you have downtime. It's completely at leisure. Somebody else, their downtime is the joy of weeding the darn garden. Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, My I, one girlfriend, she has the most beautiful property, and but she enjoys it. She enjoys deciding which flowers would look good there and she enjoys digging up the dirt and I'm just like not me girlfriend no way (laughs) I admire her home I I love it and I always say to her I love to be in your backyard (laughs) your backyard (laughs) meanwhile I have a townhouse that has a patio that doesn't I've lived here four years I've never I've never even put a single there isn't a single item on it there isn't a chair there isn't a rug there isn't anything there isn't a grill there isn't a nothing I've walked out on it twice you know, to go around the back side of the house to get something. But, you know, I, I you know what? If I'm going to sit still, it's not going to be in my backyard. I'm going to be with my husband somewhere. <laughs> because if I'm sitting still in my house, I'm going, huh, you could be inside and you could be on the computer. You could be editing a show. You could be doing a quote. Like, no, if, I have to, if I'm going to sit still, i got to get away from the building. Right. Go away. <laughs> so anyways, I never forget. We bought the townhouse. My one steps on said to me oh we could you could make this look so cute you could put a, a patio and you could put a, a grill I'm like uh-uh not buying a single thing for it uh-uh not happening <laughs> yeah so anyway all right one last topic I'd love to just talk with you about yeah. before I let you go is this uh, this um tell me how and it j- just explain to us how it is possible because I know that it is you're doing it other people have done it tell me your philosophy and how it probably maybe it doesn't even come up but when you have your high-end luxury client and then you are attaching and having the product line that's available for all the regular us regular people of the world so for instance what I mean by that is it seems to me I, I I've I've I, I've had people 
in other industries, relations with friends and colleagues, where, for instance, they, they one particular person was at the very top of their game in the makeup industry, very, very top of their game, and they were approached by a lower-level brand of cosmetics to put their name attached to the cosmetics. And the agent for this uh, colleague of mine, this friend of mine, was like, absolutely not. You cannot do that. And so that might be very true in that industry. I have no idea. But tell me about that, having on one end it very clearly defined brand that's clearly bespoke and luxury, and then being able to have product at Smith & Noble for $100 for a valance that we both know I can't buy the fabric for that by the time I put it, sew it together unless it's mass produced. Tell us about that philosophy and that opportunity and how it makes sense for you. I think that's a good question, Luann. I think that, you know, good design is good design. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing my high-end client projects, we're very transparent. We don't do markups, you know, so our price is their price uh, unless it's custom and we have some other formulas that we we work. But if I think my lighting that is, you know, $295 is the perfect choice for their home, I'm going to use the lighting. Lighting, you know, it doesn't... good, you know, ex- luxury interior design, whatever that means, it doesn't mean expensive. Mm-hmm. I, if I find, you know, our fabrics are available to manufacturers, they're available retail and they're available to the trade. And we you know John and I are the new brand ambassadors for Calico and, and Calico is my favorite store in the country. You know, mm-hmm. that there is no other, people still think of it as a fabric store and it is a fabric store, but it's really a custom workroom mm-hmm. that you can go into any Calico from California to Connecticut and have them reupholster custom window treatments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I love that. I love that you can go in there without an interior designer and that they can, they're in homes or talented and can take you and guide you on that journey with Smith and Noble. They're making window treatments that are off the rack. Mm -hmm. So I love that I'm slicing, dicing that pie to say, hey, maybe you don't want to go custom with doing a window treatment at Calico, but you want something off the rack. Smith & Noble gives you great options, but they are not giving you exactly custom as Mm -hmm. Calico could do. So for us, you know, I don't care if I find something on the side of the road and it goes into one of my interior design (laughs) clients' projects. If it's good, it's good. good, And so for me, it doesn't mean it has to be a name brand. You know, for me, luxury doesn't mean Chanel Gucci Prada. Luxury means a pair of jeans that fit, a good watch, and a sofa that is beautifully scaled and is, you know, certainly I school my clients on why, why Gracie wallpaper would be great for your dining room and it's going to be more expensive, but I will tell you the why Mm. it's not about, I would rather not have a lot of money with my projects in some cases because it, it challenges me. And I would love John and I would love to do a, you know, that red roof in that I mentioned earlier, you Mm -hmm. take a, a chain motel and you have a certain very low square footage number that you have to create the magic right. and that's the fun you know if you throw if you throw money at anything if you have tons of money you can do anything uh, who wants to wear chanel head to toe i think that the way we want to live now is a great pair of jeans a chanel jacket a white t-shirt and some jewelry you found on the street in soho right and i think that that's what luxury means to me luxury is experience luxury is conveying a story luxury is the idea that you can come home and it puts a smile on your face luxury doesn't mean that you know find if you find something magical at, at home goods or world market, that's luxury. If you find something that you love at Bergdorf's that you love, that's luxury. You know, I don't think that luxury means that it has to be expensive. Luxury doesn't mean it has to be a certain name brand attached to it. It's it's experiential, and if it makes you happy, it's luxury. I mean, Dorothy Draper once said, "If you like it, then it's right." Mm. It's uh, you know what I have to say. I think it's pretty bold of you to say all that. I think it's honorable, and I think it's amazing that you say all that because I think that um, I, I mean I'm I'm almost at 300 interviews, and I don't know that I've really had your level interior designer express that that hey if it's at home goods and it fits it's good. I think that there's a lot of hierarchy in the interior design industry. Looking down, looking up, you know, you can't this, you can't that, and you're just liter- literally proof that if it is tasteful and it l- looks right and you think it's right, then it's right. Yeah, I mean, I was in Publix last night and they had a banana display with a blue and yellow canopy and I was kind of impressed and it's totally inspiring something in our in a new furniture fabric collection like <laughs> you know and I will I will say that I was inspired by Publix my local grocery store so I think it's the idea of keeping your eyes open and I don't John and I don't negate any experience whether it's a road trip to Florida 
or a, a meal or a hot dog on the street in New York, you're gaining experience and you're looking at things in new ways. And, and I don't price, I don't care about price. Price doesn't mean to me if it mean anything to me, you know, I will, it, if, if, again, if it's good, it's good. Mm, I love it. I have to say, Reading about you, following you on Instagram, I was really very thinking I'm so lucky that I'm going to meet you in person in March, and now I'm even more anticipating it. I, just such a, an amazing way of looking at things, such a great energy, such a positive vibe. I, I mean, w- what a gift you are. Thank you so much. Can we go have cocktails in Tampa? I, I, know, all, I, know, all the, I know all the hip places. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So I'm just going to let everybody remind everybody that you and John will be giving the keynote address. It will be at 8 a.m. on March 27th at the International Window Coverings Expo. And um, the the expo goes 26, 27, 28. So there's a lot of workroom stuff that happens on the 26th and things that are good if you're in the workroom realm. And then 27, 28 are when all the seminars and the meetings are happening. My uh, presentations are both on the 28th. I'm doing um, high ticket, master the the art of high ticket window treatment sales in the morning, a three-hour super session. And in the afternoon, I'm doing a co-session with Madeline McRae on establishing and setting and achieving your goals in 2018. So um, Jason Oliver, tell us a little bit about your keynote address and what we can expect and give us a little teaser, entice everybody to come down to uh, Tampa and meet us. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm exhausted, Louie, and listening to your schedule. I will definitely be at that (laughs) seminar about goals for 2018. So that'll be fun. But I think it's the idea that at 8 a.m., giving people that that story about how to bring prints and patterns Mm. into their home and using window treatments as that jewelry uh, in your space, but really walking the audience through spaces that we've created and telling the story behind them and how we've used those bespoke details and prints and pattern to take windows that were really unloved and to you know take take or take nice knockouts nice windows and really make them knockouts Mm, that's awesome i love it it's 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 such it's such a treat for us to have you down there for this expo and i think that it's going to be uh really a fun couple of days i'm really looking forward to it (laughs) yeah i think that's a key it's gonna be fun i mean so many trade shows are not fun and iwc is going to be a lot of fun and there's a great crew who's going to be in attendance oh yeah i mean and i have to say grace and her team are just aces if they just just do things right and it's really an enjoyable few days so well i'm really looking forward to meeting uh you in person and john as well thank you so much jason oliver for coming on the show today and telling us all about your business and your philosophy and the things that you've got going on i really appreciate it well really an honor to be on the show so thanks again luann So first of all, how much do you want to be at the IWC in Tampa this March? I mean, right? (laughs) I was struck not only by how fun Jason is, but at how intentional a businessman he is. Together, he he and John Lucky have thoughtfully planned each component of their design firm, from niche to brand message to diversifying their income streams. This is one keynote I'm certain you'll be glad you attended. And the cool thing is, in addition to Jason Oliver and John Lucky being there, there are so many other great seminars and speakers lined up for the IWCE. Grace McNamara and her team, Anya, Amy, and Annie, and all the others really put together a terrific couple of days that are so jam-packed. It's actually a whirlwind just trying to keep up. And talk about getting your money's worth. The lineup of speakers this year not only include myself and John and Jason Oliver, but also Michelle Williams will be there. She was episode 137 and 180. Deb Barrett will be there. She was episode number 53. Madeline McRae will be there. She was episode 283. And the trim queen, Jana Phipps, will be there too. Little teaser alert, she'll be on the show in the next couple of weeks. So for more information on dates, registration, exhibitors, and all the other seminars that are being offered at the International Window Coverings Expo, head over to wwwiwce vision dot com. That's I W C E dash vision dot com. A big huge thank you to you for joining me today. I know you have many things in a day, 
to grab your precious time and attention. And I'm always so grateful for the time that you choose to spend with me. And I always do try to do my very best to make it worthwhile for you. Now go out and make a change in your business. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events. 